Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I now have the great privilege of introducing our luncheon keynote speaker. He's the uh, Lieutenant Governor of the state of California, Gavin Newsom. He's very well known in Silicon Valley, of course, because uh, he served for seven years as the mayor of San Francisco, and he was, in fact, San Francisco's youngest mayor. Um, and he led the city during a period of growth and economic uh, expansion, also a period of recovery for that city. And while serving as their uh, mayor, he was, as you well know, extremely outspoken and active on a wide range of social issues. While he was the mayor, he also brought a very aggressive technology agenda to San Francisco. And now, as our state's 49th Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom is touting Silicon Valley as uh, the path forward for California, particularly its style of innovation. He is the author of Citizenville, How to Take the Town Square Digital. And this is a book that's uh, uh, generating all kinds of attention nationwide, but it's certainly resonating right here in Silicon Valley. And today, the, governor's, the lieutenant governor's remarks will be uh, wide-ranging, but he's certainly going to discuss how technology is flattening hierarchies and uh, how data is empowering people and how today's policymakers actually have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to redefine the relationship between government and its citizens. So we're going to hear from the lieutenant governor, and then he has uh, very graciously agreed to answer questions. And the questions will be moderated by our co-chairs. And so we're going to bring uh, our co-chairs back to the stage, and uh, they'll be seated here uh, together, and they're going to have a fireside chat, and you yourself will have the opportunity to be texting your questions and comments as well. But now, we bring to the stage the 49th Lieutenant Governor of the State of California, Gavin Newsom. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Russell. And thank, oh yeah, keep going, that's good. I need music everywhere I go. Is that it? You guys are fabulous, thank you. Uh, I needed that because I get a little somber every time I come down here and look at that Santa Clara 49er stadium next door. Oh, uh, don't rub it in. Don't rub it in. Heartbreak. Heartbreak. I'm looking forward to being there opening day. Uh, uh, great to be here, Russ. Thank you very much for uh, getting me down here. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you for uh, promoting my book. I am a politician with a book. It's nice to have that book promoted, especially today, since you can all go to Amazon and buy it as you should in bulk because it's out in paperback today, which I am quite proud of, uh, which exactly, that doesn't always happen. With a nice blurb from Bill Clinton, perhaps that's not surprising as a Democrat, but another even nicer one from Newt Gingrich, my new close friend, <laughs> who has been out there trumpeting this book. He was at CPAC, that big conservative conference, true story. This was about three months ago. He had eight minutes to give a speech. Six minutes were apparently about me. I got a call from a reporter early Saturday morning West Coast time, he was on East Coast time, said, do you want to respond to Newt Gingrich? I said, what are you referring to? He said, he was just talking to you at CPAC. I said, oh, Christ, what was he talking about? He goes, well, he's talking, to, and he, he starts, I said, well, hold on, hold on. Let, you know, I'm an old sage now, I'm, you know, 17 years in politics, so I, I said, hold, give me your number, I'll call you back. And uh, I learned that he was talking about the book, so I decided that the best way to respond, because I didn't know if he said good things or bad things, is... It turns out he said some very, very nice things. And my response was, uh, I have to reread my book. Uh, <laughs> what the hell did he find so interesting? Uh, and that response precipitated uh, moments later a, a nice email uh, from Newt. And, and he and I have become, I won't say close friends, but uh, uh, closer acquaintance than I ever expected in my life. So anyway, uh, enough of that. I have one of the, the ominous things for you and as well as me, is I don't read or write speeches. Uh, so I may get all over the map. And I was uh, getting a sense of the flavor 
of not just the room, but what you've been talking about with Sal and others, uh, talking about the issues of income inequality, the challenges of this bifurcated and hybrid economy we have, this Gatsby curve on uh, income inequality and mobility in this state and the has and the have nots and the challenges of uh, education and to retool, et cetera. So I want to pick up on some of those themes, uh, but Russell gave me an introduction uh, and apparently wants me to talk about things I wasn't prepared to talk about, so I'll pick up on that. Uh, but I want to begin with this. It's hard to be anywhere near Chuck Reed and not agree at least fundamentally with this. I think there are three big things that are going to dominate the debate, uh, not just here in the Valley, but the State House in California, for that matter, State Houses across the country, uh, and in our capital in Washington, D.C. Number one, yes, the issue of debt and entitlement. How we address the promises we made yesterday at the same time invest in our growth engines tomorrow, invest in infrastructure and education, invest in uh, robust research and development and the like. Number two, the issue of energy and climate change with respect I think that's self-evident. Going through now the 31st month in a row, the driest period California's ever experienced, 17 counties, rural counties that may be out of water in the next 60 to 90 days. That's not hyperbole. 12% snowpack, maybe it's 13 or 14 because Mother Nature's been generous to us the last 24 hours. This is real. But the one I want to focus on is the one I think is most resonant to you and certainly picks up on the themes that I've been focused on uh, in my book, in my work as Lieutenant Governor here in our state, and that's the issue of the merger of IT and globalization. I had the opportunity uh, a few months back to interview Tom Freeman, and all of you read his book, The World is Flat, because 4.8 million copies were sold, so the chances are all of you read that damn book. It wasn't that long ago, you remember, that was on the New York Times bestseller list in 2005. It's a book about technology and globalization. Many of your companies are in there. Again, 2005, just a few years back, a book about technology and globalization. He compared the world we were living in to Gutenberg and the printing press that brought us post office and universities. And he was saying the issue of the PC and the internet and search is radically re-altering our economy along the lines of that printing press. And the book, as I said, sold millions and millions of copies. And you go back and I, Tom, had a wonderful way of summing up. When I reflected, I said, well, what world are we now living in, Tom? It was 2005, this is a year ago, 2013. He says, well, you know what? You should go back in my book. I said, which one? He said, the world is flat. I said, I've heard of it. He said, it was on the New York Times and I finished the sentence in 2005. He says, go back in that book and look under the index, look under FFAFC, a book about technology and globalization and Facebook is not even in the book. He says, when I wrote The World is Flat, talking about the world becoming connected, Facebook didn't exist, Twitter was a sound, the cloud was in the sky, 4G was a parking space, apps were things you filled out to get into San Jose State University, LinkedIn was a prison, big data was a rap star, and Skype, for most of us, was a typo. Think about that. None of those things existed as we know them today, and they're now completely ubiquitous in our lives. His point, as he summed up the point, was we're no longer connected, as he noted in 05, but now hyper-connected. No longer interconnected, but interdependent. The merger of IT and globalization more IT bringing us more globalization, more globalization bringing us more IT is radically changing everything. The way we work, the way we live, changing markets, changing the way we educate. And I would argue government is on that collision course with that future as well, which I'll get to in a moment. His point is we're now dealing in a world where as Tyler Cowen says in his best-selling book on the bookstore today, where the average is over. You can't continue to do what you've done and get what you've got. As business leaders, you know that. The rate, speed of change is unimaginable just a few years ago. The global curve has risen. We're competing no longer just with cheap labor. 
but everybody has access now to above average automation, above average software, above average robotics, and ominously above average cheap genius. The global curve has risen. So as your lieutenant governor that chairs the Economic Development Commission in the state, I think about the world in that context, at least this world of California. You cannot look at the issue of jobs and the economy in a state as large as ours, the world's eighth largest economy, without considering that backdrop. What world are we living in? What are the trend lines that define this world? What's happening with this merger of IT and globalization? How is it impacting job creation? How is it impacting wages? How is it impacting the conversations you had here today as it relates to trying to reconcile our failed education system, our failed prison and criminal justice system, and to begin to address that conversation you all had on income inequality, the haves and have nots. So that's, that's my predicate. That's my opening statement. That's the backdrop to which I think of the challenges this state faces. But I'll tell you, let me just bring it home. I just got back, I flew back moments ago, well, late last night, early this morning, from San Diego, where I spent a couple days. I left Marin County, where I live, 4.2% unemployment. We'll get the new EDD numbers in a week. National numbers came out today, we're waiting for the California, but this is two weeks old. 4.2% unemployment, lowest in the state of California, of the 58 counties. I was down there yesterday in San Diego, a stone's throw away meeting with economic development leaders from Imperial County. 22.5% unemployment in Imperial County. Calusa County is not much farther behind, 20 plus percent. Depression era unemployment numbers. But you know why I was meeting with the folks in Imperial County? Because they're in a crisis mode. A meatpacking plant just announced in April they will be shutting down 1,300 jobs lost in the county. Wait till those new unemployment numbers come out in May and June, reflecting the impact of just that one plant. 4.2, 22.5. We're living in two completely different worlds in this same state. Talk about that hybrid economy, that bifurcated economy. Talk about that Gatsby curve that we're all reflecting, the haves and the have-nots. A state that still has more people living in poverty than any state in America. 60% of the kids in the K-12 education system, 60% are on free or reduced lunch. There was a national study, I don't know if you saw it, it brings it home to me. My God, the world I take for granted. That shows over half Americans today cannot put together $2,000 in an emergency over a 30 day period, even if they go to check cashing places and get one of those 485% payday loans. One half. I bet 99.9% .9 of you could easily do that. That's the world we're living in. So what is globalization doing to it? Well, I don't know about you, but you know, I, I, I've been called a Luddite, but only recently. Because there's this mythology, right? Some say, well, technology is destroying jobs, but you know better, because you know the history of industrialization, you know the history of technology. Ned Luddite was wrong. Technology doesn't destroy jobs, it may in the interim, but it creates many times more jobs than it destroys. And that's certainly been the case for hundreds and hundreds of years. But now you're seeing a new decoupling. You saw Jared Bernstein's big piece the other day. That all of a sudden, first time we've seen this in over 200 years, we're seeing a decoupling of productivity and employment. And a lot of research is now being done by the folks that were promoting this fundamental belief that technology creates more jobs than it destroys, now questioning their own work based on the new evidence that's in. And looking at these trend lines, particularly as it relates to stagnant wages and lethargic job growth, as we move to automate more and more. And it's an ominous sign. I'm not convinced the evidence there because these are short trend lines. They don't tell you enough. But it starts making you question. When you think about Freeman's comments of just the last seven, eight years, 
And then I spend time with my friend Peter Diamandis over there at Singularity University or spend time with all of you, and you say you ain't seen nothing yet as we move mobile and local and social and cloud and crowd. And now we see what they refer to as the combinatorial economy or the convergence of these technologies, where the big marriage this year won't be that marriage with Kate and whatever the prince's name was last year, but this year's marriage of Siri and Watson, where artificial intelligence converges with big data, where genomics, where I was down there at Salk yesterday in San Diego, converges with synthetic biology, sensors with robotics, the Internet of Things, as Cisco rightly is capturing. The world is radically reorienting. We're going from something old to something new. The industrial economy has run out of gas. Dan Topscott writes a lot about this. The industrial economy has run out of gas. It has served us so well, hasn't it, for these last 200 years. But you look around, large, top down, this is Russ's opening comments to me. High arctical institutions are collapsing everywhere. They're in atrophy, they're failing, they're stalled. I remember sitting there as mayor of San Francisco in 2004, and we were in a big conference about the fate and future of newspapers. A guy named Phil Bronstein, you may remember him. His, he was a Komodo dragon, bit him, uh, married a well-known actress at the time. And someone in the audience said, Mr. Bronstein, um, in the Q&A, said, what about this guy named Phil? And Phil Bronstein said, well, who, Phil who? He says, you know, not Phil. He said, I'm sorry. Um, I got it wrong. You're Phil. He said, a guy named Craig. And he said, Craig who? He goes, no, you're that guy Craig with the list. And I'll never forget Bronstein sitting there going, oh, Craig Newmark, he's a friend of mine. We got this. That's not an indictment of Bronstein. But 79 major newspapers have gone out of business in the last nine years in North America alone. That's a study that just came out a few weeks ago. Entire business model was gutted, just like that. Technology came along, gutted the classified ads. Heck, I know what's happened to publishing. You don't buy paperback books, you download them. I remember sitting there, great to be mayor again of San Francisco, invited to Moscone Center. A guy named Steve comes up on stage, thousands of people behind me. I'm in the front row, and he comes up with this thing. He was, must have been listening to Sean Parker screaming and yelling at Lars Ulrich, Metallica, and Napster going back and forth. And a guy named Steve was down here with all of you. Some of you may have been in the room with him. And ladies and gentlemen, comes out with a little concoction that can download music, iTunes. Literally, guys like Richard Branson didn't know what hit him. Virgin Megastore was out of business. Remember that? Down in south of Market, right on Market Street, Union Square. It was done 24 months later. Entire music industry destroyed. You haven't bought an album since, have you? You've been downloading songs, maybe even for free. I've got an uncle. We all have uncles. He passed away a few years ago. He'd probably be, it's about, what is it, one, one, one o'clock? He'd be on his second or third martini now. Great guy, Rick. I miss him. Maybe you talk about the good old days until a guy named Chuck came along. See, my uncle Rick was in a stockbroker down there at 235 Montgomery Street. Used to be the tallest building on the west coast of the United States, owned by Walter Shorenstein, the Rust Building, beautiful building. He was there for years and years. He talked about the good old days where you had to buy a stock, didn't matter how many shares, he'd charge you at least 100 bucks. It was great. Until Chuck Schwab came along and destroyed the whole business model using technology, E-Trade. And now you're seeing all these pink mustaches everywhere, right? Those damn pink mustaches. A guy named Travis comes along and does what I couldn't do as mayor. I was desperate to get rid of that damn cartel called the taxi industry in San Francisco. And Travis comes up with an app. And now everybody's using Uber. Folks up there in the share economy at Airbnb, something different is happening. We're going from something old to something new, and government is on a collision course with that future. We, in government, are on the leading cutting edge of 1973. <laughs> we are. By the way, that's when we built the architecture, the plumbing, at the DMV. It's a fact. Now, we got some fancy websites we built on that old plumbing. Make you feel better. 
But that thing's collapse any minute. We went through a procurement process, didn't go so well, $208 million. We spent $135 million, weren't even halfway done. We fired the contractor, we're back to square zero. The head of the DMV said, it's a dangerously antiquated system that could collapse any day. He wasn't kidding. It's code red. Barack Obama got this, didn't he? Let's just talk about that candidate in 2008. Remember that, even if you're a right-wing conservative, and many of you are, and I appreciate that on some level. <laughs> I do, I do. Newt has taught me a lot. And, but in 2008, it was an amazing campaign. I was on the Hillary side. I, I just, what the hell just happened to us? This thing called MyBarackObama.com, platform thinking. 35,000, remember this? 35,000 self-organizing communities come together across every conceivable difference. People were having something called a two-way conversation. Unbelievable. Self-organizing, two-way conversation, platform called MyBarackObama.com. And you had this candidate start talking about change starts from the bottom up. Yes, we can. No one knew it, hit him. Clinton campaign, done. Who ran again? McCain, done. You forget. And he transitioned, I'll never forget. Remember change.gov, he said, I wanna continue the conversation. I'm a new kind of leader. Forget the first 100 days, that's where people focus. In politics, I wanna focus on the next 100 years to restore moral authority. Not only the United States and the White House, but the rest of the world. He said, what's on your mind? He wanted to continue the conversation. All of a sudden, the president-elect says, change.gov is our new platform. We're going from the campaign to this transition platform. Continue the conversation by joining me in an unprecedented town hall. Thousands of people physically in a room and millions and millions of people all online. Everyone waiting with bated breath. What do the American people have in mind to set the tone and tenor for the next 100 years in America's journey for restoring moral authority? And he decided to give some people some hints. He says, is it the issue of Iraq and or Afghanistan? Is it the issue of climate change? Is it the financial meltdown? Remember, this is right after Lehman Day, which was September 15, 2008. Is it the financial meltdown? What's on your mind? What should be my number one priority as your next president? With bated breath, you may have even participated in this. American people came in record numbers, and the president took out an envelope on that fateful day, and he opened up that envelope. Was it Iraq? Was it Afghanistan? Was it the war on terror, climate change? Was it the financial meltdown? No, the dominant number one priority that fateful day during the transition on the minds of the American people was legalize marijuana. <laughs> Man. Man. So the president-elect did exactly what all of you just did. And you may recall, you may recall, you can even go back. That site's still static, change.gov. Check it out. I'm not making this up. And the online community went crazy. He said, hold on. You wanted to have a two-way conversation. Yes, we can. Well, what did the president-elect do? Did what 99.9% .9 of us would have done. I don't criticize it. He converted. He did. He said it was so overwhelming, the reaction to that site, that they had to turn it off to upgrade the software, <laughs> sound familiar? And transitioned it, because it never came back, to whitehouse.gov, the old static site that had existed for years. This bottom-up candidate transitioned to a top-down president. Yes, we can became yes, he can. You vote, I decide. The old broadcast model that Sal Khan is fighting so hard to destroy. The old industrial mindset, selling down our vision. From one to many, centralized, closed, opaque, the old operating system. But you know better than everything else, that's giving away to something completely different. The new operating system is open, it's transparent, it's collaborative, it's about sharing. The borders of your organization are becoming more and more porous because you subscribe to Bill Joy's law. Remember Bill Joy, Sun Microsystem? One of the co-founders said, no matter how smart you think you are, how smart the folks are in your organization, 
the best people work for somebody else. It's true. There's wisdom in that. Let's all move towards the crowd. But in government, we don't operate like that. We treat you like subjects. You vote, I decide. The best you could do is petition me to do something for you. It's machine thinking, right? You put in a dollar in taxes. David Kettle wrote about this years ago. Put a dollar in taxes and you get, it's like any vending machine. You get limited choices. Police, fire, health care, education, national offense. And if you don't like what you get, you've all done this. You shake the machine. You kick it. Right? And we're having a debate in Washington, in Sacramento, in a lot of city halls about the size of the machine. Still debating an old industrial mindset in a world that's radically changed. Steve Jobs got it, right? When he came out with the iPhone, it was a platform. He didn't come out with 700, 800,000 apps. He came out with a few. He said, remember at the time, he said, the greatest innovation is not going to come from this. It's going to come from all of you. And it gets you thinking, perhaps government should operate more like a platform, less like a machine. This idea of two-way conversations, which any business leader knows is the only operating system for success, needs to take shape in government. We have got to decentralize and personalize and customize our services. We need more voices in government, more choices. There's a reason people don't vote. They know better. It's a great quote from Lincoln. We're all quoting Lincoln because we all loved that movie last year. He said, we're all born originals, but we die copies. We're all born original, but we sadly die copies. It's just like that with politicians, isn't it? You get so motivated. You buy into the shtick every two to four. It's amazing. It's so easy. Convince you. Boy, she sounds really great. She's different. This is something wonderful. Then she gets sworn in or he gets sworn in. And first term, you go, what the heck happened? And they say, well, I'm going to give that person another chance. Then they'll be termed out and they won't have any of the incumbent problems because of, you know, they're never going to run again. And then it always ends badly, doesn't it? It's as if governing degeniuses you. Just like Lincoln was saying life, because we're stuck in an old system, in an old mindset that has to give way to a new operating principle. I really believe it's code red. You're not going to solve the great challenges of ignorance, poverty, and disease. You're not going to radically realter an education system unless you're listening substantively to guys like Sal. He's not interested in reforming. I don't think Sal came up here, I hope, I didn't hear it, and talk for an hour about seniority and tenure. Did he? Because, hell, that's the entire debate in Sacramento, right? We'll fix this thing. Let's just get rid of seniority and tenure. And then, meanwhile, the new PISA numbers came out. You saw these, what, three, four weeks ago? The top performing K-12 through education system in the United States, you know where it is, Massachusetts. The best 15-year-olds in math are performing at the equivalent two and a half years, school years behind their counterparts in Shanghai. Average is over. You can't continue to do what you've done and get what you've got. It's not as if we're collapsing. It's the world is rising. It's the rise of the rest. No longer competing with cheap labor, but cheap genius. Dozens of states don't have seniority and tenure. Hell, they're not even coming close. Forget Shanghai, but to South Korea to Finland, to Singapore. It's just not a good enough answer. You've got to reimagine a 21st century education system. In a hyper-connected world, there's no choice. If you're seeing a decoupling of productivity and employment, if we're seeing stagnant wages as we continue to automate and we ain't seeing nothing yet, the only way out of this is to radically reimagine a 21st century education system. I know this just as a father. I have a four-year-old, two-year-old, and six-month-old. Two years ago, I kid you not, I walked in early one day and I saw my daughter with my iPad. I had never seen anything like it. She didn't know I was there. I was looking down, whoa. And I went to Santa Clara University, a good Jesuit. So I got excited. I, I looked and I said, she's the one. <laughs> I did. My wife was so proud. She's big into gender equality. She said, I knew it would be a girl. <laughs> and, you know, she's a prodigy. It's obvious. Look at her. You probably have the same experience, right, with your kids and grandkids? 
She is flipping through. She had everything. She would literally, she had some Dora the Explorer app, and I think she was connected to a friend. They were co-creating some peer-to-peer -peer transfer. It was everything but my credit card number, and soon she'll figure that out. It'll just be my thumbprint. She'll probably come up with some clever way of getting it. You can't educate her like I was educated. My mom plopped me 24 hours a week in front of the TV, broadcast model, right? Satiated me. That's how nine out of 10 of your brains were wired. Their brains are wired differently. This net generation bathed in bits, the participation generation, right? Digital natives versus the digital immigrants. Guys like me, many of you learning the language of technology. It's not natural to us, it's not intuitive. So Sal Khan gets it. But do we get it? We're still debating how many rows of desks, i.e. size of our classroom, there'll be. Whether or not we'll continue an extra week so we can allow folks to keep toiling the fields during the summer months or whatever the equivalent is in the world we're living in. We still have, I am on the UC Regents, CSU Board of Trustees. It's the only thing, seriously, if you were, if you went frozen 100 years ago and you came back, you'd be, you know, you couldn't wait make it down the block, but if you can make it to UC Berkeley, oh boy, you'd feel right at home walking into the theater in that lecture hall. Nothing has changed. Sage on the stage, broadcasting his or her vision, rote memorization, the old reading, writing, arithmetic, just no longer relevant. I read, you saw the big interview with What's his name, Lonzo Bach or something, the head of the people department at Google, senior vice president of people operations, says we could care less, GPAs are useless. He says 14% of the folks on some of our critical teams never even went to college. We don't care how much you know because, well, Google knows more. We care about what you're gonna do with what you know. But we're still educating people with an old pedagogy that literally comes from the British Empire. I'm sure Sal talked all about that. And he's an antidote, flipping the classroom. Teachers are coaches and mentors and tutors. We all know we learn more in team settings, but we don't do that. It's code red in higher education. Give me a break. We're educating people to unemployability. It's like Kodak. I got in a lot of trouble. I'll close uh, in just a brief minute. <laughs> I got in a lot of trouble. Jenna Napolitano, I don't think she was happy with this. Our new leader at UC, I said, our discussion reminds me of a discussion must have been like at Kodak's board of directors a few years ago. Pretty offensive, right? But I was kind of serious, right? I mean, Kodak was making the same. I, we got market share. We were the number one brand in higher education in the world. We had just patted all ourselves on the back. I've done it three years in a row. We get up and every university comes up saying, the new Shanghai Index, top 25 performing schools. And you know, there we were again, there's Berkeley, there's UCLA, all these fancy schools. And everyone's, it's just amazing. So proud to be part of this organization. We had seven of the top 25 and you go, well, what, when last year wasn't it eight or nine? And so I said, well, you know, we, were we had 15 and you know, I don't know what it was, 10 or so. All 10 of our campuses were in the top 15 a few years ago just like Kodak, right? We're doing fine. Meanwhile, we're educating people that have no real skills that are relevant to the world they're entering into in this hyper-connected world. All those middle skills. Do you remember the old days of high wage, high wage, middle skills? That's what bolstered up our middle class. Those are over. You know that. I mean, a college degree is like a high school degree now. Big damn deal. I mean, it's a must, but it's just the beginning. Why do you think General Assembly and all these fancy little certification programs are popping up everywhere? Why do you think Sebastian Thrun decided to partner over there at Udacity with all of these businesses directly? Because we ain't conveying the talent from San Jose State or all these other universities. We're not getting people trained in the skills they need. We're a complete disconnect between the business community and higher education. I love the UC system. I want it to thrive, but we're playing in the margins. We're arguing to fail more efficiently. It's not just about lack of 
state support and tuition increase. It's much deeper than that. It's the same old pedagogy. The world's changing. No wonder the MOOCs are taking shape. And they're in their Alta Vista phase, aren't they? Everyone's deciding the fate of MOOCs, but hell, they've barely gotten out of the garage. They just started. But something is taking shape here. Sal Khan started it when he got introduced that day by Bill Gates at TED. I was there. I'll never forget it. And now he's being proven right every single day. But we're not scaling things. So that's my long soliloquy. That's my admonition to you to start thinking differently and demand we act differently in public life. We are on a collision course government of the future. We have got to dramatically change our operating system. And we've got to reconcile that world we're living in. So that's a long way away of saying what I could have just said in 30 seconds. Thank you for your example. Thank you for your leadership, for your stewardship. Thank you for your faith and devotion, not only to this region, but the state and the nation and the world we're trying to build. And I look forward to working with all of you because I'm convinced of this. The best is yet to come. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, if you're still willing, we have 10 minutes remaining for questions. Sit in the middle. Our co-chairs are going to join you. And you can start texting onto the screens, and they're going to engage you. Go ahead. We'll start with uh, maybe you, Chris. Sure. Uh, let me ask you this opening question. Nice, easy one. Uh, some say the state is uh, ungovernable. It's too big to govern. So what do you think about maybe dividing the state up into, I don't know, six states? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, and I... I I'll be respectful in front of that. I don't, look, I don't buy it. I, I think this state has, I mean, our balance sheet is extraordinary, and I wouldn't want to break up that balance sheet. Uh, you know, we have more scientists, more Nobel laureates, more researchers in this state, more venture capital in the state in America. We started the biotech industry. All these industries that are going to dominate the future are emanating disproportionately out of California. I'd hate to see it broken up. And with respect, I don't know how you can break it up. Uh, I think Governor Brown and, frankly, the voters of California have proven it can be governed. And so I'm not willing to give up on it. Get and uh, I think ready. the macro strengths of the $1.9 trillion economy play well in terms of our ability to compete on a global stage. Lieutenant Governor, former mayor, that's really the most important I part know. of your resume <laughs> Real in work. my book. Back in uh, May of 2011, uh, you went to Texas. Uh -oh. uh, you, you got some criticism from members of our party for... I don't know, consorting with Republicans or going out of state. I don't really know about that. But you did come back yeah. and got fired up about economic competitiveness and uh, led many of us in an effort to produce what is called an economic growth and competitiveness agenda for California, presented by Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom in August of 2011. Yeah. So two, two and a half years later, first, what did you learn in Texas? <laughs> yeah. and second, what's, what's happened with this agenda? Well, I was sick and tired of Rick Perry coming in casing our joint. <laughs> coming in on what he called hunting trips, hunting for jobs in California. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it wasn't just Rick. You know, it's nice when I go through SFO, I know a bunch of the folks. It, it's almost every damn governor in the United States coming through here consistently, coming, visiting you, making a case for their states. These guys are in the game. And I wanted to learn from them because one thing I know, I remember Sam Walton wrote about famously his strategy at Walmart, which is called the eyes of the enemy, that he was constantly casing other people's joints learning from his competitors. And it kind of reminded me that California hadn't been doing that in decades. We put up our, our feet. We rested on our laurels. We were the tentpole of the American economy in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And from 1980 to 2010, PPIC put up these numbers. We've become average. The national economy has outperformed California's economy in the last three decades, in a world, again, where average is over. So it occurred to me, perhaps success leaves clues. And Texas was creating more jobs dominantly more jobs than any other state in America. So we visited Texas, but also a lot of other states. Learned about the Third Frontier Program in Ohio. Learned about the strategies of exports in Pennsylvania and, and uh, Florida. We decided to get involved in some of the manufacturing a renaissance that was happening in Germany and the plug and play zones in Singapore. And we tried to inform all of that in this uh, document. I'm doing an update. 23 or 24 of the 30 plus recommendations have been implemented. I'm really proud of that. And I give Governor Brown and the legislature a lot of credit for stepping up to the next level. What we need, though, is an evangelist. 
we're still not making a strong enough case for our success. Rick Perry is brilliant at celebrating success. We are not. And there's an old sage, old line, you know this in your life, you're nothing but a mirror of your consistent thoughts. Whatever you focus on, you find more of. And we tend to manifest. We have been so down on ourselves for a decade that we see what we despise every single day. Guys like Perry are very good at raising the bar of people's consciousness on what's right. And it tends to follow that it tends to manifest. And so I think we now, having moved from a debate around solvency with respect to the trend lines on entitlement and debt, being still an ominous up, uh, challenge for us, we now need to move to a debate around greatness again and get California back to its rightful place. Perhaps a, a, maybe a technology-oriented question, but as a mayor, as both of your mayors, uh, you feel close to your constituency because you walk by them every day. In San Francisco, you see them, that's where you spend your time. But in Sacramento, there's you know, nearly 40 million people, and it, the other people that walk by you all the time are not necessarily your constituents, they're the vocal ones. So do you think there's a hope for technology to provide a more cohesive voice for the population to reach Sacramento yeah. the way you were when you were the mayor? Well, see, you know, I've always believed you don't like the way the world looks when you're standing up, stand on your head and go local. Remarkable things are happening at the local level. When I got discouraged around jobs and economy in the state, and you know, we still have an 8.3% unemployment rate. We still have uh, these counties like Calusa and Sutter and Madera, and obviously I noted the 22.5% problem in Imperial. We have 1.53 million people actively seeking work that can't find it. We still have a huge challenge. But one of the wonderful things is I traveled the rest of the state. I saw amazing things happening at the local level, and it gave me real optimism. And so the pyramid, and this goes to the old industrial frame I was just talking, the pyramid's being inverted. The days of the guy or gal on the white horse to come save the day, which we still have this mythology of, that goes back deep into our psyche as Americans. I think it's giving way to this idea that it's not just one leader, it's leaders. It's treating people not as subjects, as I was telling you, but active participants. Not inert citizenry, but active citizenry. And when you think in platform ways, it's about cultivating and coordinating. It's not about command and control. The new operating system today is about climate control, creating the right conditions where success becomes irresistible. It's about regions rising together. And our whole framework, again, is bottom up, not top down. Regionalizing the unique strengths and characteristics of all the regions in this state and building on them and reconciling the areas that are no longer, again, relevant to the world we're living in. And so local government, for the right reasons, and understandable reasons where innovations occur in states, laboratories of democracy, cities, laboratories of innovation, cause and effect, good decisions, bad decisions, and immediacy. And technology can provide the platform for active citizen engagement. Again, more choices, more voices. You're seeing that peer to peer, donors choose. You see that with Kiva, you see that on all of these sites like Indiegogo and Kickstarter and everything that's happening in terms of using platforms to disintermediate and solve problems directly, how can government capture that energy and once again reconnect it to government? That's where I'm focused on, and that's long-windedly what my book, Citizenville, is all about. I'd like to pick a couple of questions out of the, uh, the text messages that are, that are coming in. Uh, of course, since I'm picking them, I'm going to pick the ones I want to ask. <laughs> but that's the benefit of being up here. Uh, let me ask one that uh, is near and dear to me, and that is, uh, what are we going to do about the uh, Calster's unfunded liabilities problem? The governor said, we need to do with it. We'll do with it after the election. Speaker Perez says, we can't wait till after the election. Let's start talking about it now. We've got some committees that are talking about it. Does that mean something? you think something is going to happen? And if so, you're placing bets on which direction the legislature might go? The reason we haven't done it is we've been in crisis mode. Was that money going to come from K-12 through education? Was it going to come from health and human services coming from an aging and grand population? Was it going to come at cost to funding local government, jails, prisons, probation, parole? And that was the struggle in the last 10 years. Remember, when we got there, we had a $42 billion projected budget deficit. It netted out realistically to about $27 billion. We're now projecting a four to $6 billion surplus. So now we can have a conversation that's not just rhetorical but substantive about using potentially some of that surplus and their projected revenue, particularly around Prop 30 over the next few years, to begin to start substantively paying that down. The governor, to his credit, has begun to pay down on that wall of debt, including, with all due respect, Governor Schwarzenegger's deficit bond, 
which was costing us hundreds of millions of dollars in interest. And now we'll substantially paid that off. So we are making wise fiduciary investments in paying down that debt. We have to deal with this four to five billion dollar gap on the CalSTRS. And that means making that down payment and demonstrating that with real money in the May revise. So it's a long way away of saying, Chuck, I absolutely am convinced we'll do something. And we've got to ramp that up to do more than something because you, more than anyone else, understand we're simply not in a position to neglect this any longer. We owe that money and we owe future generations uh, to make sure we don't oblige them uh, with our naivete and neglect. So yes. Uh, we're almost out of time, but let me ask one more open question. A lot of great minds in here, a lot of great minds in Silicon Valley. Uh, a lot of them have very strong opinions about the ways things should be, but hardly any of them run for office. Yeah. So what yeah. would you say to encourage the entrepreneur and the business leader, the civic leader, to take the path that you did? Well, <laughs> or not? Well, I, I was in business <laughs> first, so I, you know, it sounds like you all you can take that path. But, uh, I encourage it. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking just very briefly, and I know we have just 90 seconds. You know, I was thinking with Mandela. It was amazing. I was talking to my friends with all the post analysis Mandela. I bet no one in this room, including none of my friends, could tell me two or three things Mandela did when he was president of South Africa. Seriously. Outside a symbolic move here and there, give me one public policy thing he did. And no one cared, which is an extraordinary thing. We celebrated a leader that transformed a nation and our consciousness around the world. But it wasn't his position of formal authority we celebrated. It was his exercise of his moral authority. The most admired man in the world today, you know this, is Bill Gates. You start thinking back to the greatest transformative leaders. Not all of them, but a disproportionate number of them have an equivalency in common. We celebrated the March on Washington in 1963. It wasn't ex-president Martin Luther King we were celebrating. We didn't celebrate the life of ex-prime minister Gandhi. I don't know that Cesar Chavez ever was governor, or even for that matter, Mother Teresa Pope. You kind of go back to the most transformational leaders, even Havel himself. Remember Havel, the Velvet Revolution and Czechoslovakia became president? Talk about the issue of geniusing. He lamented going from philosopher to politician. And he wrote a seminal work called The Power of the Powerless after he left. How he struggled with formal authority. So it's a two, it's a quick way of just a long way of quickly ending. Answering that two different ways. You don't need to be something to do something. Being in power doesn't mean you have power. I think it's a noble cause. I'm sure Chuck does as well. But the cause is only noble if you restore a sense of moral authority in these positions of formal authority, and you have the courage of your convictions, and you're willing to stand on them. It is utterly trivial to consider a career in politics if you're considering a career in politics because you won't get anything done. You may enjoy that chicken dinner and the 15 beautiful framed pieces of accomplishments or whatever proclamations we hand out that they give you at the last minute, but the minute you're done, they'll walk right past you. I hate to admit it, Chuck, I mean, it's the reality. But it's your, you know, so it's your capacity to lead that now exists. Imagine Gandhi with Twitter or Facebook. Imagine King with these platforms of engagement. You have that. You have the capacity to do extraordinary things. I hope you do it in politics, but all of you are leaders and have an extraordinary capacity to radically change the life and trajectory of this world. Gavin Newsom, thank you for your service to our state. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you for coming to our gathering.